But I've been fully conscious of it. People everywhere have created images and representations, carved out of nature, straight from their most glorious dreams or terrifying nightmares. In the age of technology and the mind-boggling capacity to produce and multiply anything in a virtual world, millions of these images proliferate. Fighting for space in the public, already teeming consciousness, claiming to serve the public's needs to be entertained, to be taught, to be dazzled, to be taken into a fantastic world where wishes can be fulfilled and or deadly desires contained. Centuries ago, Aristotle and Plato already observed how these images contained in Greek plays were not innocuous texts, but representations of the most serious magnitude that provided insight into the people's varying experiences and how they sought to cope with these almost inexplicable realities and momentarily cope with them. Then and now, catharsis or purgation is an operative word popular text and the collective imagination. In the Philippines, various producers of texts from the Spanish period to the 21st century have, collected, have collectively imaged the world in various and sometimes violently contradictory ways. The Indio as a traveler of the stormy night on his way to the father in the 17th century poem, May Bagumat May Rili. But bizarre's depiction of the strike on Albania, Albania as a panglao ng agubatan in Lorate at Laura, 1838, and Desmond representation of the bloodied mother of an infant crying for revenge against the oppressor, Lope de Santos' representation of Ang Pangingera in early American rule, Stephen Avellana's view on how the Japanese forces exploited the country not by inflicting death only, but by forcing women to prostitute prost prost themselves in without seeing the dawn. A tapestry of Filipino values and ideas has also been woven in you in other texts, as in Macari Pineda's lyrically evocative image of Maria Makiling and the absolute need for every Filipino to aspire for the ideal for the common good in the novel Anginto sa Makiling. In Severino, in Severino Reyes' lovable image of Lala Basham, as she narrates her legends and folk tales to children caught up in awe and wonder. In Mars Ravelo's strange mythical creature, Jezebel, where the violence of the mermaid of European legend is tamed into a woman whose only desire is to be loved. In Pablo Gomez's Dana, as the hope of the oppressed, denied held by powerful institutions, in the director Ishmael Bernal and scriptwriter Ripley's insistence that walang himala, in the riveting image of Elsa, the conflicted faith healer in faith healer. In my own celebration of idyllic young love in Kumangarat Kat Magisin, in General Tao's masterful image of the Aradam and Insulent and Raluna, driven by a burning love of country in the monster movie and Raluna last year. Our senses continue to be bombarded with the thousands of images, the television news programs, teleseries, magaseries, sports programs, game shows, turn out or the chaos and virulence produced by radio commentators and now in the chilling of virtual worlds in this universe dominated by Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pokemon Go, among others. Thus, both traditional media, films, television, radio, newspapers, and magazines, comics, and the contemporary media that has problematized how in the world the truth and the slippery term reality have joined forces to assault our senses, leave us wondering what the point is of all these glittering, shimmering, contradictory images that confront us at every turn. For example, what are we to make of the phenomenal album, a portion of the long-running Ibulaga that struck so many chords among the millions of fans here and abroad, it has become a certified hit bring new life into a program notorious for the ribald and vulgar jokes by the program's hosts and the images of perpetual, perpetually gyrating of naked dancers and mindless games and transform Nathan and Dona and Dollar Richards, the eight lovers in the initial segment, into instant millionaires and help create the Alda Nation. When examining against the 
context of popular culture as the found success because of its astute use of social media modes, tab smash, big shots, simultaneous narratives, the obvious mind mimic tradition, visual spectacles that border on the ridiculous. As importantly, as dog mind traditional forms, the theme of unrequited love from old novels and movies, the slapstick tradition of Dolphy and Panchito, the Badabit tradition of Herman Moreno and other singers and comedians at the Old Clover Theater and Manila Opera House. Nor can we dismiss the powerful didactic tradition from older forms that conveyed moral lessons as dished out by the three ridiculously attired lolas, maghintay sa tamang panahon, huwag magpadalos-dalos, maging magalak at magkapak, ang pangangailangan maging malinis, maging matalungin sa kapwa, etc. Indeed, the workings of the mind are difficult to fathom. But in the case of Aldov, what the public saw, day in and day out, pero ngayon, wala na, no? September 3rd, tapos na siya. Resonated with millions of images that lie in their collective unconscious, to use used phrase. The site where accumulated images, impressions, representations, ideas that have evolved for centuries continue to survive because they have meanings for the community. And to casually dismiss these deeply embedded images and representations given novel forms in contemporary culture is to display not only one's colonial mentality, which millions of Filipinos, including us, possess, but a pathetic lack of knowledge of what cultural texts are and what their functions are in society. Those were cultural studies, the reign of the bakya in academic thinking. The forms that appeal to millions of people needed to be written about. Some of supplements of the Manu Times and the Daily Mirror, for example, feature the phenomenally successful opera such as Bulog ng Palad or Ilaw ng Tahanan. Films and stars were the stuff of movie magazines in the 1950s and 1960s, the movie columns in weekly magazines such as Levi White and Black Black, and in the comics magazines such as Filipino Comics, Yuvaga Comics, Special Comics, Yuvaga Classics, etc. They chronicled the lives and loves of the stars of the moment. Gloria Romero, Lito Blanc, Amalia Fuentes, Susan Rosas, Nora Honor, Vilma Santos, Guy Enfield, among others. Columns in English and Tagalog newspapers also had columns on the movies. A few examples were the columns written by Nina Flor and Nita Mali Brandel Sen, the mother of Karen Cardenas. The ubiquitous comics, and arguably the most popular fair in the 50s and 60s, and the source of hundreds of films, was gradually given space in some magazines, such as Sunday Times Magazine, or in magazines that have since then become defunct. In 1970, Mad Comics Magazine, such as the, the Noral North Entertainment Magazine and Tip Entertainment Magazine, came out to rise and open popularity of Noral North and Tears of Cruz the Third, the reigning on screen romantic pair. You know, equivalent of Kathleen and uh, JD or something like that. Akadi would not touch these artifacts, Akadi would not touch his artifacts with a 10 foot pole as late as the 1960s. For academics proud of their high academic achievements and their ilk in the upper and middle classes, also proud of their enlightened education from colleges and universities, and this preferred language was naturally English, the language of power and of powerful institutions, texts in Tagalog belong to the lower class. The popular works were nothing but predictable variations of the kiss-kiss banta motif of romance, Love and violence, the humor they dish out belong to the toilet, the created world belong to fantasy, the language is either sentimental and flowery in films or tongue in the comics. Their world was their worldview was either old fashioned or in the case of some comic stories, too grim. Because the characters were foul mouthed prostitutes and drug addicts. Prone to violence, inhabiting the dark, dreary, depressing world of the slums in Tondo where there are lots of bodies sprawled on the ground, or the streets of Piaco, a haven for pickpockets, prostitutes, and beggars. And they were all in Agalo, Tendang Maridad. A word eventually emerged and used with power 
to designate all these uniquely single-minded, formulaic, gross narratives that appeal to millions, but not to the power-building minority. The term is bakya. Very pretty. I'm referring to the old picture of the bakya, like most Filipinos wore, no? The term is bakya, which had been traditionally used to refer to a pair of wooden clubs that as late as the 1950s were used by most Filipinos. The term was used in the 1950s to refer to the multitude of the teaming masters walking in their bakya who could not appreciate the award-winning films of Lamberto Avellana that included Bajau and Anak Darita. The term stuck and was eventually deployed to further make fun of, fun of her content art and marginalize the local economies, the films of Sampagita and the premiere, and even the songs of Eddie Peregrina and Indian that appeal. Nora Lord considered one of the finest actresses made hundreds of films that fell into this category. The way these poor water vendor from Nicole with their dark complexion and non mystica pictures, but gifted with a magnificent voice adored by millions, was not on the radar screen of a minority group that held power. This remains a cautionary tale of how words never neutral when used in a specific context, can be wielded as an effective instrument in a class war, where the rich engage the poor in an unequal battle. To further consolidate their power and be made more inaccessible to the blighted minority, to the threatening other, to the marginalized and dispossessed, the much maligned masa. This is the first and last time I will use the term masa. Jose Lacaba, in his perceptive essay, notes on Makya, I think that this genre of ideas and value judgments for popular text was at the popular text was the receiving end of any evaluation, mostly unthinking, should ultimately be rooted in two categories. The first was the Filipinos' colonial mentality, shaped by decades of American rule, where the foreign was valorized over the local, even if the foreign was considered by American critics themselves as K-I-T-S-C-H, Bakya, in other words. Hollywood films over local films, American singers over the likes of Bobby Gonzalez and Kiki de la Cruz, a classic illustrated with their Cinderella and Snow White and Marvel comics, no boy, no boyfriend, with their superheroes over Hiraka comics, with their Pandai and Captain Marvel. And even why with Zola Tasha, Dallas, and Falcon Press over Home Along the Rivers, or Zolo Nang Palad. The list goes on and on. The second was and remains to be a crucial factor. The socio-economic category has determined how the text presumably, presumably produced for the common people in a language that they could understand, figure the peak depicting the experiences of exploited by the folk, the people who need the Dharna or Pandai, the denizens of Manila slums, constructing the characters not gripped by a question of identity, as in Nico Kings, the woman who had been enables, or Antien Gonzalez's The Bamboo Dancers. Walang problema ng identity sa mga tao, mga poor. But by more familiar and immediate issues of where to get food for the table, or secure the materials to fix the shanties blown away by the rest. Ang problema ng identity na sa atin ngayon sa UP students and teachers, no? For the dramatic pivot in the 1970s, the first of history, the impact of interrelated historical events in the late 1960s and early 70s, and the accumulated rate of millions of cultural texts with which the nation's complex experiences have been represented, reflected, refracted, problematized, and interpreted, constructed, could no longer be denied and curiously banned by the powerful minorities. The surge of nationalism was the necessary result of the social political events before and after the declaration of martial law. With the fact politicalization of various sectors of society, farmers and workers, professionals, the press, law, military, and government, less importantly, academe and the students themselves. A great force was an initiative in the nation that in the late 1960s was teetering on the brink of destruction like now, huh? affected by the continued effects of colonialism, the rule of a president, the Marcos, who refused to surrender power, and the dominance of the powerful class and the ideological apparatuses they controlled. 
This is not to say that activism cannot relate to the creation of interest in cultural texts. That is false, false possession. It is important to stress that key moments that took place in Akadim during the Tsipiotic period before the Anti-Generation Partial Law appeared to coalesce to produce a less traditional and less critical view of cultural texts. The pivot already begun in the renewed interest in vernacular rate in the 1960s, for example, Brown Heritage and the Philippine Studies Essays of Rivera, and the insistence on the importance of realistic and political texts, thus leading, for example, to the publication of the activist Zigwa in 1972, spilled over into the study of popular culture, no longer as the blighted, unfortunate third cousin of literature or popular films and songs no longer viewed mostly from Western aesthetics. That scholars and critics must turn their attention to local texts was a mantra in academia. We lived through those days. Thus, if various individuals deliberately chose to study local dramas, novels, or stories, poems, among others, situating them against concrete historical context while veering away from the privileged formalist perspective. In 1975, the Cultural Research Association of the Philippines was founded composed of faculty members from FU, USP, UP, and Ateneo, concerned with the methodical and, and, and systematic study not only of literature, but of various parts of popular culture. The journal International Popular Culture Run came out in 79 and featured articles on popular songs, the comics, Ghibli, soap opera, among others. The group Panula, on the other hand, from UP focused on the production of text for the fiction theater rooted in the ongoing political struggle. That led to focus on these marginalized aspects of culture, not only as areas that should interest researchers and critics, but as importantly, materials that could be used in various classes such as English, Filipino history, social sciences, communication, among others, solidified with a series of national conferences for teachers from all levels. They're both held in the, at the Ateneo in 1988 and in 1990. Both of them came out as books eventually. I'll share with you. Some of the leading scholars in this period, the Rivera, the Mundo, Fernandez, Reyes, Isagani Cruz, Felipe de Leon, Bernard Johnson, who devoted their time to research and publishing articles and books in popular forms from the Sarsuela in Sinapolo to music and films and the comics consolidating the gains and the influx of theoretical writing. Having laid the foundation for the need to analyze cultural texts from a more academic perspective, and more importantly, from a nationalist framework from the 1970s until the 1990s, the field of cultural studies was further enriched by the work of younger researchers and scholars interested in further cultural studies. Some of them are here. The early generation of critics approached the text using a combination of approaches but basically as literature teachers. The studies were done revolving around the themes, characters, plot and structure, and in many cases along, especially by the Marxist-oriented critics, along ideological lines. But in perspective, the critics, although sufficiently grounded in literary analysis, stuck to the more familiar terrain, where they explored the issues the way of literary critics would as a formalist, historical, or Marxist critic. Wala kasi no temporary papers, no? Context was always a major, a major factor, but how history and its processes, particularly shape the text in complex ways, must not develop. This would come only in the 1970s with the works of the structuralists, the post-structuralists, uh, like the post-colonialists, the eh, eh, also the French and German scholars. Armed with degrees from local and foreign universities, and having been exposed to works of prominent theories of critics, undoubtedly determined by the veritable explosion of knowledge that led to the emergence of such tools as structuralism, post-structuralism, feminism, historicism, semiotics, the canon, psychoanalysis, queer theory, among others, the younger generation more than willingly applied their knowledge to the study of popular texts. The approach was necessarily interdisciplinary. They had models for their own analysis in the pioneering works of such theories as the Frankfurt School, Roland Barthes, Frederick Jameson, Camille Paglia, Mikhail Blachtin, Jacques Lacan, Michel Foucault, Edward Said, among others, whose critical perspectives could be traced to their own grappling with varied theories. In the post-war years, in England and Germany, for example, several works dealing with popular texts and as 
specific ways in which they were received by the common people as readers or listeners have been published as foils to the elitist tendency to banish this popular text to the margins. The works of William Howard, and quoting with many British scholars, Raymond Williams, Stuart Hall, and in a few, revolutionized the way in which popular artifacts were traditionally viewed, thus problematizing the concepts regarding art. What is art? And what is culture? One of the pioneers, of course, was Raymond Williams in the 1960s. On the other hand, the number of critics who examined the role of the reader and listener in the reading process in the movement for the reader reception. In this view, the reader was perceived as an active producer of meaning, an idea that did a lot to liberate the reader from the view that they were mere passive receivers of the text messages. Nothing happens here when they read something and when they see a film and uh, follow um, a movie. Consumers of popular culture were as capable as those of any culture to process and make sense of the experience of reading, viewing, and listening. Not only the residents of the gated villages can understand text, even the poor citizens from the villages, etc. can understand as well. Importante yung kamayat sa ating kultura na. Consequently, we find in the writings of such scholars as Patrick Flores, Roland Valentino, Jamie Caprino, who's here, Jay Plavid Jacobo, Gary De Villes, Joven Velasco, Michael Andrada, Yuven Nariete, Johnny Ross, and Eduardo Summer, Louis John Sanchez, among others, a further enlargement of the scope of analysis and a more human's understanding of the text production and consumption. In a few words, the works of Roland Tolentino, the impact of globalization and subsequent commodification of culture. Such essays have come out in university journals such as Philippine Studies, the Riddell, Manet, and Una, to name a few. This tendency is demonstrated even in master's thesis and doctoral dissertations being written in various universities. A proof that this form of scholarship and criticism has been institutionalized in the past few decades. Cultural studies and society. In retrospect, the newly emerging movement to focus critical attention on passes to popular culture had as its objective to force a powerful institution, academe, not the now, to wean itself from its entrenched preoccupation with serious and literary works. Kumbaga, mga Shakespeare, Africa, Mugnan, Tikwaki, English, both local and Western. Thus, the tone of the collective voice was political. The stance was to be on the offensive. The proponents of the underdog and the underappreciated engaged the more powerful group in a debate. In the 70s and the 80s, these individuals unceasingly pointed out the importance of the color movies, the comics, television, radio shows, original Filipino music, among others, in any attempt to make sense of the Filipino and their understanding of the world. And you cannot not operate on the brain to find out where they're taking off. So the next best, best thing is to look at what they're reading and consuming and try to understand them from those perspectives. The world denigrated as fantasy. Featured in the works of national artists Francisco Vico, Chin, Marcelo, Pablo Gomez, Jim Fernandez, the name of you, or the films of Andrea Conde, Octavio Silos, Luciano Carlos, the name of you, resonate with the millions of comics readers and movie viewers for reasons other than their escapist tendency. Dara was a powerful presence because for centuries exploited by the powerful, the common people had for one moment a shiny example of the magnanimous hero willing to help and save them from blood fires and dance of murderers. On the other hand, the films of Lino Brock and Ishmael Bernal, Tinimbang Pang Munikula, Nane Kung Tata, and Nilo Sa Tubig, and Nilo Magnite, for example, were riveting depictions of the dynamics and crisscrossing interests of family life in the barrio but in the city. In the chaos of contemporary life, where much violence and lack of civility characterize much of our national discourse, I always do that every afternoon, no? 
in image in fortifying and more skills of presentations, the function of cultural studies has become more central. In the age that has witnessed the uncontrolled proliferation of text in social media, the undisciplined deployment of sound bites, the blurring of distinction between what's real and what is virtual, the irregulated thirst for instant gratification, which media provides so abundantly at the expense of truth. And in an era where glittery images are glibly passed off as truths, by powerful publicity, yes, by Aranyan machines, what tasks lie ahead, especially for those who teach? I was asking you to teacher there is a research of some interest in producing more diverse texts, the poems of Juan Miguel Severo, the numerous individuals, and so happy about this development. Many of which have received prestigious awards, musical groups, experimenting with music, the variety of sites featuring versatile young performers. We would should welcome these forms and encourage independence, foster creativity, and harness their many most potentials. As teachers, we should strive to incorporate them into our own classes, even as we explain how this new form is both a continuation of tradition and an enrichment of tradition. For example, how is Carlo Rivera's Angkin at Kagila, Kilala sa Pakigipagsapala ni Yasha Saturna? How is it a contemporary interpretation of Dharna, of the comics, to even the ancient motif of the Messiah, the Redeemer, the Savior? And how does the graphic novel use contemporary language and images that resonate with the younger generation? Or after the poems of Severo, Trace the Roots to the popular Tagalog like poems of love and protest, or under the works of Manny Severo are above, above all, impact the millennials. In our classes, we can focus on the series, on how the series of Messiah that figures in Philippine politics assume different forms, the way in which these individuals have been deliberately constructed and met different ends. The list includes such figures as Jose Rizal, among Maxay Sai, Ferdinand Marcos, Corazon Aquino, Joseph Estrada, among others. The analysis which you tackle the text that were created to refurbish their image or demonize them in tales, books, in newspaper accounts, and currently on the internet. Future scholars should be gathering materials on the internet concerning the protracted and oftentimes virulent war being waged between two controversial figures, almost always, the former president and the current president, whoever the protagonists are. As importantly, we should instill in the minds of our students or make it clear among the readers of our essays and books, or future writers, we talk, that we need to develop highly critical minds. It is not enough to describe a phenomenon, the rocks to which stories of Manny Pacquiao, or the fun thousands of times you write from watching Pinoy Day Brother on Channel 2. For example, the serious student of culture should probe the process that led to Pacquiao's success. In sport, in a sport which reeks of violent stay tuned for an audience of mostly affluent patrons asking for love. In some plush hotel in Las Vegas, the mecca of the rich and famous, under the tutelage of an American, a modern version of the little brown brother of Yao, being mentored by Freddie Roach, the great white father. A question, a que the question is, is Yao really a hero? If he is, what arguments are being advanced? No? On the other hand, we should ask the reasons for PBB's popularity apart from the prizes that of the contestants. We should find out how much of the sort of reality show is staged, manufactured, constructed. The real reason for choosing individuals, you don't choose a black boba or a man of anger, choose them for their beauty or their miserable love stories. Who winners on our talent shows and what a poor how much voyeurism is encouraged by the program? It is voyeurism. Where individual is stripped of privacy. How steep is it in a Western viewpoint? How much distance is exemplified by the impact of globalization? In other words, 
We must not content ourselves with what lies on the surface. Ang nini sa halip na liwanag. All texts are motivated, produced for a reason which is frequently hidden from us. Friend, they have a specific point of view. For example, I can such as my favorite, Chris Aquino, or what I detest, or what ganda, are covered by layers and layers of images and impressions meant to create the definite persona and television. What you read on the internet is not only the truth, what you read in the newspapers, including the Philippine Daily Choir, is only part of the truth. There is a snap. There is a motive for featuring the grieving wife of a tricycle driver shot dead against the biblical command, thou shalt not kill, at a headline in the Sunday Inquirer. At no time in our history is the role of the culture critic such tremendous importance. Unlike the early critics who had to defend what they were doing, like me, in an environment hostile to such activities, contemporary critics should no longer be on the defensive. Popular culture in an age where exclusion is no longer tolerated to the detriment of those who have the power is and must be a serious field of study. The amount of protest and peroration from the elite and narrow-minded academics can refute these assertions. We are assaulted daily by images and sounds from morning to midnight. To try to make sense of these jarring images and cacophony of sounds is an awesome task. But persevere, we must. Our job as educators and writers compels us not to be mesmerized by such dazzling and mostly fabricated images, nor surrender to the politicians and other celebrities honeyed or vulgar words, you know who I mean, as the case may be, nor to merely shrug off what we see as injustice in display of duplicity and violence because we love ourselves into believing we are powerless to do anything against terrifying and monstrous systems. Government, mass media, business, the military, religion, among others. This, of course, is easier said than done. As in the legends and tales, there are trolls, there are not trolls. There are trolls. It's a wild, big, huge picture of trolls. That is the law and the figurative. There are trolls to haunt and destroy us. We might end up dead on the streets or on the internet highway. They terrify us with their dynasty and ruthlessness. But as right as we have the duty to analyze and reveal what lies underneath, this is the function of our studies that should lead to more clarity in our understanding of popular culture and its role in society. Conclusion. A society is unrecognizable without the clashing and whirling millions of images, presentations, and constructs of itself. This process of production and consumption is never ending. To a careful, intelligent, fact-based analysis, the critics should be able to frame this text against their specific context. The ideology of the period, the motive to produce of the producers of the text, and the material condition and psychological makeup of the audience for whom the text built, the essay, romance books, or the commentaries, graphic novels, newspapers, or blog, continue to be produced and disseminated among millions of Filipinos. In the final analysis, such critical activities as teaching and writing are attempts to enable the public to make sense of their lives. Parang, this life is so senseless, no? By raising crucial issues that affect and shape their experiences. As writers, we should strive to produce texts that challenge the mind to be taken for granted realities from a more novel perspective. As teachers, we mold minds to enable the students to look at the world with wonder, but at the same time, we brought them to view the reality around them in a critical spirit. Ask, why must it be so? Thank you and good morning. Uh, I was trying to give, a brief, uh, give you a brief idea of what my talk is going to be about, particularly in the context of my talk, which is to say that I think um, there's not enough archival work that's being done in the study of Philippine popular culture. So much of the work um, tends to look at the present, to apply Marxist or gender theory, and call it a day. Um, and I think that it behooves us as scholars, um, if we really do value Philippine popular culture, to do the necessary research in order to shed uh, more light on the kind of phenomenon that we are studying. In 1994, uh, in 
the house of Sigmund Freud, the philosopher Jacques Derrida gave a lecture that became the basis for his celebrated book, Archive Fever. In that book, the late philosopher traced the etymology of the term uh, archive to the Greek word archaeon. Initially a house, the residence of the superior magistrates, the archons, those who commanded. Kept in those houses were documents of the law that were consulted to determine the fate of the persons. But the archive is not only a collection of documents managed by the state, it is rather, according to Derrida, I, and I quote, an accumulation and capitalization of memory um, on some substrate and in an exterior place. In two of his unorthodox examples, Derrida points to email and circumcision as forms of documents in archiving. The point is that there are many kinds of unofficial archives and many archival structures. Um, and that's relevant to popular culture, uh, quite specifically. Derrida's book was one of the landmarks of a reconsideration of the nature and status of archive in academic work. What Laura, what Anne Laura Stoller calls the archival turn, the move from archive as source to archive as subject. The title of Derrida's book self-consciously describes a nostalgic and impossible desire among Western scholars to, quote, return to the authentic and singular origin, unquote, what historian Carolyn Steedman describes as the beginning of things. It is impossible to find such origins because, among other things, the process of archivization leaves out more information than it records and is constantly losing the information it collects. The persistence of the desire for origins in the face of this impossibility is captured in the title of Derrida's book, Archive Fever, a sickness for the archive. Um, I guess in Tagalog it would be Lagnat Archive or Lagnat Sinuban. Um, let me confess, I am hopelessly sick with archive fever, a malady I developed while a communications major here in Ateneo when I began working on a play about Jose Rizal and learned with great wonder that I could read facsimiles of his actual letters, travel diaries, even his grocery lists. Since then, I have been scavenging in archives here and all over the U.S. to write a different history, that Philippine cinema. I have returned here to Ateneus Halls to the site of my infection with archive fever to tell you some of my best archive stories about Philippine cinema. The historian Antoinette Burton describes archive stories as, quote, narratives about how archives are created, drawn upon, and experienced by those who use them. My explicit goal is to testify to the import of some of Philippine cinema's hidden, vulnerable, unusual, and undervalued archives and archivists. But more than spinning tales, I <laughs> Friend of mine, a fellow Atenista, 
who had immigrated to the U.S. just a few years before me, invited me to spend the holiday with him and his friends in Washington, D.C. We joined the revelers near the Washington Monument. I bought a tall glass of lemonade, extracted, rag, extracted right in front of me, in the powder, and I was so impressed. At dusk, fireworks capped what seemed to me like the quintessential American experience. The following Monday, I took a subway to the Library of Congress, a stone's throw from where we stood on Independence Day. To look at old films our American colonists made when they occupied the Philippines. The old librarian gave me a can of film about the size of a round cake of peanut brittle from the Pandas. I spooled the reel of film about um, on a steam deck flatbed, a machine used for editing movies. And this is one of the first films I saw. Apart from conserving the past, 
These films are antidotes to the willful forgetfulness of American imperialism. They also powerfully challenge the myths of American benevolence, which many of us mindlessly perpetuate to this day. Several dozens of the archival films I just showed you became the basis for my doctoral dissertation, which I defended in 2002. Since then, I've kept yearly appointments at the archives in Washington, D.C., digging by, bit by bit for more films and histories buried in the rubble of time. Why has it taken so long to complete this work? Among other things, there is no expert on the Philippines at the archive who could help me estimate and locate their holdings on our country. This despite the fact that the Philippines is America's only former colony. And so with our history buried in fragments within the colonial archive, the experience of writing our history is true to what the cultural theorist Tommy K. Baba calls or describes as a post-colonial remembering, a putting together of a dismembered past. Over the years, my remembering at the archives has led to more discoveries, which I have framed into new academic projects. In the process, I have come to recognize the value not only of the post-colonial character of Philippine cinema, but also its transnational dimension. One of the things I've been working with uh, my Ateneo colleague, uh, Dr. John Labellia, is an account of American melodramas set in the Philippines. In her book, The Anarchy of Empire and the Making of U.S. Imperialism, the literary scholar Amy Kaplan wonders why it is that despite its significance in American culture, and I quote, no major films have chronicled the three-year-long war in the Philippines. And she's talking here about the Philippine-American War and the early years of the colonial encounter. As it turns out, this claim is partly incorrect. We found about a dozen uh, American melodramatic films and plays set during the early years of the American Empire in the Philippines. About half of those films were made or revived in the next two decades after the Philippine-American War. This means that American cinema's memory of the war and its aftermath was broader than imagined by Kaplan, who worked with a much smaller archive of films and literary texts than what was called for by our project. Here's what we learned. Of the films that were made long after the war, most of them occurred in the early 1910s and one in the late 1920s. So what happened in the early 1910s that reawakened the American public's interest in the events of 1899 and the beginnings of U.S. colonialism? The answer, various incarnations of the Jones Bill, proposals to grant Philippine independence, were filed in the United States Congress. This triggered a moment of reckoning, a questioning of why America country founded on anti-colonial struggle versus Britain, a righteous nation supposedly no longer tolerant of enslaving colonial colored persons, was still involved in formal colonialism. So let me show you excerpts from one of the Philippine melodramas of the American Empire. The film is called A Man Be Man, La Lahi La Lahi. This was made in 1911 and then retitled His Gratitude when shown again in 1913. So Jones Bill is like 1912, you can see uh, that the interest in generated by that bill led to the showing of the film. The film begins in the US and shows an American man, a civil engineer, bidding a temporary goodbye to his fiancee before departing for a stint in the Philippines. In Manila, he is hit with a bubonic plague and is abandoned by all except this Pinay, who flirted with him one day while he was working. To better take care of him, the Pinay dumps her native boyfriend. When the American gets better, he marries her, but very reluctantly. They even have a dusty child shown here. But here's the problem. U.S. newspapers inaccurately report his death, spurring his grieving fiancé to retrieve his body from the Philippines. So what happens? 
the Americana shows up and the Pinay becomes Hanggang Pierre Lang in the Thank You Girl, correct? Surprisingly, in this fantasy, not. Despite American society's taboo on miscegenation or interracial unions, the American stays with his new Filipino wife. He does so reluctantly and only because it's, it's, it's ostensibly the manly thing to do. To be sure, the film is an allegory of colonial justification, and it is for this reason that the unthinkable, that is, dumping a white spouse and having sex, and a child with a native, is sanctioned. The colonialist film argues that America should continue its empire because it made a commitment and because the U.S. owed it. We sila to the natives. Mary Louise Pratt describes this typical alibi of the reluctant colonialist as narratives of anti-conquest. Narratives of anti-conquest allow the colonizer to wash his hands of imperialism positive colonial doings as a form of service to the dark races as well as to humanity at large. So a manly man slash his gratitude is in truth about the native's gratitude to the colonizer. Tayo pa may utang na na sinakot tayo. Before we move on to the next film, it is important to know uh, two things about the Filipino wife. First, it is played by a young Mary Pickford, soon to be a superstar of the American silent film, uh, silent screen, and the female protagonist of D.W. Griffith's monumental picture, The Birth of a Nation. A manly man was one of her first ethnic roles. White actress played Asian roles is what's called in the U.S. as yellow face, or in this case, brown face. The second point is the haziness of the American imaginary of the new colony. Notice that Pickford is dressed in a vaguely Mexican or Latina costume, and there is virtually nothing in the mise-en-scene or the film's visuals that looks specifically Filipino. In other words, this cross-cultural representation of the Filipinos, America's new subjects, was drawing much more heavily on the resources of fantasy rather than on fact or knowledge of the colony. Our cultural invisibility in the U.S. probably made it easier for them to consent to our continued subjugation and objection, for it is easy to hurt people you don't know. Part two. While the U.S. returned the Philippines to the Filipinos in 1946, American presence continued here not only in the form of uh, U.S. business, uh, U.S. military bases and personnel, but also in the cultural arena. Until the 1950s and the 1960s, American melodramas about the Philippines continued to be made, but this time the actors and filmmakers were actual Filipinos. During the period after the Cold War, between the end of World War II and around 1989, American anxieties about the spread of communism in Asia were partly assuaged by the enormous budgets allocated by the U.S. Congress to the creation of propaganda and to the often covert sponsorship of anti-insurgency projects in that region. So a memorable case of this was when they got bodies uh, of dead insurgents um, 
took their guts out, hanged them out from a tree, and said that they were killed by Mana Mandalas. Right? So to avoid being criticized uh, for their interventionism or the US or neo-colonialism in their ridiculous sci-war projects, the US carefully hid their role in propaganda and counterinsurgency by using dummy entities and Filipino surrogates, including Lamberto Avellana and Manuel Conde. Filipino directors were secretly commissioned to make not only documentaries, but also theatrical films that promoted American Cold War ideology. The US government used the name of a fictitious movie outfit called Freedom Films to veil its sponsorship of some of these movies. Until recently, one featured in a narrative film by another national artist, Jerry De Leon, was thought to have been lost to history. This propaganda film was secretly funded by the US government to warn us Filipinos of the dangers of leftist politics. On a recent trip to the National Archives, I found a film called Ang Bagong Umaga, Dawn of a New Day, 1952. You might be surprised to learn that the screenplay of the film was co-written by another national artist, a gentleman named Nick Joaquin. Joaquin probably wrote the English narration that is heard over the Tagalog dialogue spoken by the characters. The voice speaking Joaquin's narration belongs to another national artist, Lamberto Villano. What is this film about? It is about farmers in Hacienda who are living hand-to-mouth, living a hand-to-mouth existence. The President of the Communists was carrying out his orders to stir up trouble and make the meeting fair, while Sonia was trying hard to carry on the bargaining sentence. Sonia made the next demand, two weeks of vacation with pay. So what's happening is that Inspired by this trip to Manila, where they saw a successful union meeting in which the capitalists gave what the workers wanted, the farmers try to form their own union, and they try to negotiate with the landlord, uh, Mr. Chavez. But unbeknownst to them, one of their the members of their group, their union, uh, is a communist infiltrator, and the communist infiltrator tries hard to uh, ruin the negotiation. So the strike resumes. Uh, what happens is the, the farmers go on strike to assert their rights. The strike um, continues, um, and uh, the strikers are portrayed as destructive because the crops nearly dry out and they threaten to bankrupt Mr. Chavez. So even Tonya's wife ends up chastising him during um, the strike for putting the interest of the strikers over that of his family.
First, three of our national artists cooperated with the Americans in defaming left-leaning farm workers and exculpating unjust Ashenderos. Second, we should also call out conservative American historians who suggest that neo-imperialism is a lie or that American political influence uh, on the Philippines has mainly been illusory in the post-independence period. Because really, why be so sneaky about disseminating Cold War propaganda if you're not really dipping your fingers in Filipino national affairs? And so I, I wonder if you noticed if you, while you were watching that film, there's this terrible English over-narration that keeps on interrupting the Filipino dialogue. And the function of that is to show the American sponsors of the film that they were towing the party line. Right? that they were following the Cold War rhetoric that uh, was issued from Washington, D.C. Um, the examples I've given you thus far uh, are perhaps unfamiliar uh, works of popular culture. And some of them, many of you might not consider as properly Philippine because they were not made here by or by our own country. But I bring them to your attention because they only go to show that archival finds tend not only to enrich a field such as Philippine popular culture studies or Filipino cultural studies, but to challenge the very configuration of those very fields. My, my um, examples have brought to the surface not only the geopolitical dimension of Filipino popular culture, how it was used in geopolitics, but its inherently transnational character as well. Filipino pop culture not only absorbs all sorts of foreign influences in the process of its creation, but is significantly reshaped when it circulates abroad, often through diasporic Filipino communities or during the Cold War as part of counterinsurgency propaganda in Asia and Eastern Europe. Indeed, one of the things that happened was many of the Filipino movies were dubbed into various languages and shown in various countries all over the world, including Thailand and um, Romania. Right? So it's Philippine propaganda, American sponsor, shown abroad. So you wonder, is that Philippine cinema or not? And, and to my mind, Philippine cinema does not just refer to films made by Filipinos, um, because cinema is not just a cultural institution where someone makes movies that we watch but it's also about uh, the preeminent regime of visibility or visuality in the 20th century uh, where Filipinos are implicated. So let me, sh let me shift now to the more familiar terrain of Filipino pop culture studies in order to elaborate further my point about the importance of the archive to Philippine cinema and pop culture studies. For the past five years, I have been at work on a book about Nino Broca and popular cinema during the regime of Ferdinand Marcos. In the course of that work, I have come to show, I have come to see, rather, how the structure of Philippine cinema's archives and the character of its archival practices are inflected by gender, particularly what American scholars call queerness. Queer does not refer here only to homosexuals, but rather to the wide spectrum of non-normative and or non-reproductive sex practices, gender and identity formations, and social positions. For instance, in a society such as ours that reserves tax privileges and other legal recognitions and benefits for married people, even an unmarried heterosexual person is queer that is treated as aberrant, as exceptional by the state. This is the notion of queerness that one finds in the work of Kathy Cohen, for instance, right? That even heterosexual people are queer by the state. So in what ways are Philippine cinema's archives queer? The first lesson I learned is that some of the most important archives of movie magazines and films are not conventionally based in institutions like museums or libraries. Movie magazines are especially important in studying Philippine cinema because they publish film reviews, information about budgets and earnings, behind the scenes stories about film production, anecdotes about censorship, etc. But where do we find some of the most complete and most finely curated collections of these publications? Not the National Library as it turns out, 
nor the biggest academic library such as UP uh, in Ateneo. Instead, they are in the hands of movie fans, like James De La Rosa, who keeps his enormous collection of, his fat in, of mag movie magazines in his family's home in Bulacan. Right? Uh, he also has this internet website uh, called Pelicula Atibaba. When I was at the end of my rope looking for an actual review of Lina Broca's comedy Palipati Papalit Palit, a rare film about that treats the subject of bisexuality, I did not find the answers in the much vaunted index to Philippine periodicals or the excellent card catalog of Ateneo's Pisal Library, but rather in James's collection of clippings. And because he was compiling such documents as a fan rather than as a professional, the publication details of the review are lost. And Laura Stoller uses the term arrested histories to characterize those histories suspended from received historiography. Stoller's term usually captures the situation of films such as Palita Lima, whose histories are doubly arrested. First, because of an institutional forgetting that deemed movie magazines and popular movies as not being worthy of preservation. And second, because of a cultural forgetting that threatens both queer cinema and, sadly, non-canonical films. So we're only often just try to save the masterpieces. What about the rest of the movies that were made that are, one might argue, of equal cultural importance? If there is any hope for Philippine studies in the Philippines, for film studies in the Philippines, our libraries should be begging collectors such as James to, sweat, to sell or bequeath his collections to them before another mega flood like Ondoy hits the country or before termites attack and destroy their life's work. But the first academic libraries have to acknowledge that popular culture is important to our heritage and worthy of investment as a field of academic knowledge. Here's the thing, libraries at many American institutions have been collecting popular culture materials for decades, including such things as video games and consoles. So in collecting this important ephemera, right, what's the use of having a video game cartridge if you don't have the console? So for them, in order to do video game studies in the future, you need to have both of these materials. Um, and if you have academic libraries doing precisely that, finding as many of these things as they can and preserving them for the future. Another unusual uh, example of an unusual archive of Pinoy popular culture has been lovingly amassed and maintained by a Filipino-American pharmaceutical professional named Jojo de Vera. Jojo, who used to be a production assistant on Philippine TV shows, built an archive by salvaging the inventory of Filipino video stores in the U.S. Um, just as they were shutting down or disposing of their collections uh, beginning in the mid 1990s. So what happened was DVD, right, 1996, DVDs became popular and the Filipino groceries that used to lend out VHS tapes um, found that these materials were becoming obsolete and so they were disposing of them in large quantities. And Jojo went to these places in Southern California in other parts of the U.S. to collect these things that they were throwing out. Um, one of his recent finds was the collection of a video store in Alaska, frequented, among others, by Filipino workers at salmon canneries. So, maraming Filipino uh, immigrants to the U.S. worked in Alaska to work in the salmon fisheries. No? So, yung video store na pinupuntahan nila, um, and what was great is that um, the, the, the environment of Alaska is favorable to the preservation of magnetic tape. Um, some of the films are now on cable television. So the films that he salvaged from Alaska are on cable TV. And also on his Tumblr account, Maxine and Nile. Jojo has gone the extra step of digitally reconstructing some of these films splicing together censored footage and altered soundtracks gathered from different videotapes to approximate the original forms of landmark films such as Manila by Night and Scorpionites. Chocho has been doing the kind of work typically um, engaged in by professional archivists 
and producers of home uh, video programs such as the Criterion Collection. His efforts are backed by personal funds and what little he earns in incentives from the video sharing sites that host his work. This is really very important work. Uh, and so the, one of the largest archives of Philippine cinema are actually at this house in Arizona. Both Jojo and James are unmarried men. Their singleness has allowed them to lovingly build and maintain their archives. And one day, their social status and gender identity may lead to the devaluation of their work as being much, but not much more than a queer hobby, an archive of two men's queer devotion. In the language of film archiving, the term orphan is used to describe films that originated in an agency or organization that no longer exists and are thus in danger of being discarded, neglected, or lost. It turns out then that it is the queer, non-professional archivist that salvages and cares for many of Philippine cinema's orphans. So the irony, the notion that, right, orphan, right, um, and, and it's the, the queer people who are preserving these orphans. So the scenario straight out of Dino Broca, Santana, Kung uh, were it not for the queer devotion to cinema, the most important of those orphans would not have survived. Actually, that important calls the importance of documenting the process of archive creation, surveillance, and use, as well of, as well as of noting what is at risk in the variety of archive stories that scholars tell. In the case of Philippine cinema, the dominant narrative has been about the role of institutions, the various national archive projects, the Philippine Information Agency, the National Historical Institute, etc. But the queer narrative I have been sketching out here deserves attention, both as a matter of urgency and also as a story of hope, of what would have almost certainly been lost, but which society's others have mercifully remembered for all of us. I want to close with two examples from 1980s, 1970s and 1980s cinema that gathers the threads of this talk. Dino Broca, the subject of my next book, was also a non-professional archivist himself. He was a big movie fan and collected articles about his favorite movies and stars, especially the late Ricky Belmonte, who may have been the Alden Richards of his era. The size of his collection is such that it exceeds the shelf and storage space of the library that holds him, and is thus in danger of being lost. Broca, with the help of his former publicist and light producer, Boise de Guia, also built an archive considered to be more valuable because it pertains to Broca's own work and includes still photos, contracts, scripts, letters, videotapes, tax bills, and even hate mail from bitchy gays who were jealous of him. Uh, one such letter reads, Akinsi Alan Pauli. Uh, it, it is thus because of their non-professional archiving that I am able to write a well-documented history and critique of Broca's movies. To say that this archive can spark new interest on, and scholarship on his work would be an understatement. Example number one. In Broca's celebrated film, Manila sa Punong Liwanan, there is a gay sequence that has been famously in battle since even before the film was made. Right, and I'll show you a small clip from that. So nearly every review describe the sequence as unnecessary, unnecessary, gratuitous exhibitions. Decades after the film was shown, the animus continued. Claudio del Mundo excised the sequence from the published version of the screenplay, dismissing the section as something that was added at the director's request. Edgardo Reyes, who wrote the novel that became the film's basis, republished his book with an essay by a friend of his who claims that the director, quote, tried but failed to sissify a manly novel about an ever-masculine city. 
So notice the homophobic language. Sinubukan pero nabigo na gawin bakla ang isang bruskong nobela tungkol sa isang bruskong siyudad. Unknown to many, the original gay scene was even longer than the standard version that has widely circulated since, since the film's release. Against the logic of erasure that sought to limit realistic de depictions of gay life and subculture in the 1970s, Rocha prevailed upon his collaborators to film a long sequence that not only showed Julio, Julio falling into prostitution, but also showed his relation to working class and bourgeois gays, the latter in the curious position of exploiting poor men while also making themselves vulnerable to being harmed by hustlers and by social ostracism. The film historian Teddy Gore recalls that the integral gay sequence accompanied the film's premiere, but was later abridged, reportedly at the request of producer and cinematographer Mike De Leon. The film was passed uncut by the censors, so this decision probably had to do with De Leon's personal desires or with financial considerations, since the film was being marketed to students. When the film was restored a few years ago by funds from the FDCP and Martin Scorsese's World Cinema Foundation, the gay sequence was not made whole. Indeed, the subject was not even raised in the numerous publicity materials on the film's remediation. Thanks to Broca's own archive fever, the full script with all the expunged parts has been preserved, along with stills from the deleted scenes. Why is this important? In comparing both items to the film, we can tell, one, that Broca showed call boys roughing up gays for money in a scene reminiscent of the 1969 Oscar-winning film Midnight Cowboy. It shows how sexualized violence and exploitation are two-way streets involving two marginalized groups of society. Number two, um, Roca sought to actually accurately depict and preserve for posterity the subculture of Manila's gays by showing encounters at movie theaters and in gay bars um, that were true to that moment in time. Three, that he allowed real-life mamasans at the brothel scene to improvise some of their lines and thus to preserve a significant facet of the gay demimond. So the two uh, characters that you saw earlier in the clip that I showed that uh, were um, talking to the customer, they were real-life receptionists at a male brothel in um, Opie particularly in the Tambakan area. Um, the film, also number four, the film explored the homoeroticism and friendship between two working class sex workers, named, namely Julio and Bobby. There is an abrupt break in the narrative of the extant film that results from the omission of the final scene in the gay sequence, uh, a scene that shows Bobby tenderly stealing a kiss from Julio. The scene shatters Julio's illusion that his masculinity is impervious to the effects of his homosexual activities, which he sees as purely commercial in nature. It is this gay panic that sends Julio back to the masculine world of peons and construction workers, a plot point that was lost when the scene was removed. So if you watch Manila's Pulanguan today, there's really an abrupt end to that sequence. And this is the reason why. Um, but if you watch Broca's 1989 film, Macho Dancer, you will see that Broca seizes upon the chance to recreate this lost scene from Manila, albeit in a refreshingly more progressive manner, one that shows two moments in which the homoerotic fiction is reciprocated. My final example from, is from Ora Pronomis, a film that made the rock made in foreign money to expose the unabetted killing spree in the spotted group of vigilante groups from the Marcos era up to the regime of Corazon Aquino. These groups were legitimized by Aquino's anti-communist rhetoric and iron fist policies after the peace talks with the CPP and PA collapsed 
and also by the flow of American money for counterinsurgency operations here. This was the very tail end of the Cold War and, and the U.S. sponsored um, counterinsurgency operations in the Philippines. Roca was a delegate to the Constitutional Commission when he and Pete Acaba saw the corpses of men, women, and children splayed in the streets of a city in Mindanao, the work of vigilante police. Roca led the Constitutional Commission and also took in refugees from vigilante attacks who came to Manila to testify against those militias. He witnessed firsthand how even in Manila and with the cooperation of the military, the vigilantes continued to harm those refugees turned witnesses. In the semi-fictionalized war of Pernobis, two episodes dramatized the cannibalism for which vigilante groups like the Tatars were known. One of those episodes recreated the gruesome killing of the Italian priest Tullio Fabali by the Monero brothers, who also reportedly ate the victim's brain matter. The Aquino government, its sympathizers, and censors chief Manolin Morato, Pue, attacked Roma's film and the director himself, focusing their critique on the two scenes of cannibalism and accusing Roca of trying to discredit Corey Aquino and suggesting that all Filipinos were cannibals. A columnist loyal to Aquino, Benita Olivares Kunatan is her name, she was recently disgraced, planted the story that viewers at the Khan Film Festival vomited during the film, and quite ridiculously, that Filipina maids in France were being fired by their employers, employers out of fear that they were in fact cannibals. True to this discovery, uh, due to this controversy and to the censorship standards of American censors, the film's producers excised the two short scenes of cannibalism. Moreover, Morato, after suggesting that Broca was immoral because he frequented a gay bar called Club 690, effectively blocked the film's Philippine release something that not even Marcos succeeded in doing. After careful archival work, I recovered one of those two controversial scenes. And on this rare occasion, I will show you the theatrical version of the scene with sound, followed by an early version of the scene that was probably not seen in the Philippines, um, and if it was seen at all, it was in that first screening of the film at the Cannes Film Festival. So, I'll show them in succession. This is what the scene looks like um, in the edited version of the Motion Picture Association of America. <laughs> But Rocco was vilified for the scene and for his brave movie. 
His response was that the government should be addressing the ugly reality of extrajudicial killings rather than harassing him for depicting that reality in his film. His words about the misplaced outreach of the government and its supporters rings true today in a frightful wave of vigilante killings in the heart of the nation's capital. Just a few months ago, as I was wrapping up my archival work on Broca, I finally located a magazine that contained one of the stories upon which Pete Nakaha based his screenplay of Broca's film. The article was called The Vigilantes by Kenny Kimpo, and on its last page was the image of a man who was then running for the presidency of the Philippines. What I felt was not what Antoinette Burton calls archival pleasure, the thrill of the archival pain dirt moment, but rather it chilled down my spine. I'm even more horrified now as I come back here to deliver my paper. In 1989, our government and some of our countrymen vilified Roca for creating those purportedly obscene images that I just showed you. Today, we defend as righteous and necessary real-life versions of those images, several times more obscene. And the fear once triggered by the term salvaging has now been replaced by the banality of another term that has also lost its power, extrajudicial killing. In a highly unfortunate turn of events, the nightmare scenario of Mark Pernobis has turned into the everyday reality of the Philippines today. In the violent tableau at the end of another Broca film, Bayan Kokapit Sapatanin, has crossed from fiction to fact in one of the most iconic pictures of the Philippines under the current administration. Thanks to the queerly bold and prophetic political vision of Nino Broca, and to the archive that is his martial melodramas, we still have the opportunity to recognize the danger in re-embracing authoritarianism. Your audience, may you and I survive this perilous new era of routine state-tolerated murder in the Philippines and the equally lethal combination elsewhere in the world of American imperialist rhetoric and remote control drone warfare. May we remember the dead in the archives, all those who, in Hobi Baba's words, have suffered the sentence of history and take their lessons to heart. May we also be gripped by a strong case of archive fever so that those that come before us are left, or that, that come after us, are left with a past to remember. Thank you.